Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to some. Um, it's noon here in Colorado, and look who I found, Mass and Tracy. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Fragile X Syndrome, Autism, and Behavior, presented by our friends, also known as the rock stars, Mass and Tracy. I'm Jane Dixon Weber, the Director of Education and Support Services here at the National Fragile X Foundation. Before I introduce our speakers, I have a couple housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, today, Mass and Tracy are just going to answer your questions. So use the chat box on the right side if you have any questions, and also use it if you have any problems with your, um, with your audio or your video. <clears throat> now, I would like to introduce Tracy and Mass. Mass and Tracy are the co-founders of Developmental FX in Denver, Colorado. Tracy is a pediatric occupational therapist. She has a master's degree in developmental psychology. She is involved in clinical treatment, research, mentoring and training regarding OT interventions for persons with neurodevelopmental disorders, especially Fragile X syndrome and autism. Sarah Schaffernaker, fondly known as Mouse, has a master's degree from the University of Montana in speech pathology. She's worked in the fields of Fragile X syndrome and neurodevelopmental disorders for more than 25 years. They both work at the Denver Fragile X Treatment and Research Center at Children's Hospital in Denver, Colorado. And they both accompanied Dr. Rondi Hagerman to the UC Davis Mind Institute to initiate the program there, prior to opening Developmental FX here in Colorado. They've both written several book chapters and articles on intervention for Fragile X. They also consult and lecture internationally, nationally and internationally, on Fragile X. Welcome, Tracy and Mouse. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. It's great to be here with you guys. Wonderful to be here on Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's very special. great to have you. So every now and then we'll have to hold up our little hearts with our little messages for people on. That's right, real love. That's like it. hug me. Hug <laughs> <laughs> me. <Like B. laughs> <laughs> and of course, we always feel like we're soulmates with the National Fragile X Foundation. That's oh right. yes, only you, only you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Let's, we have a question just came in. Um, looking to put together a good sensory diet in school, looking especially for proprioceptive activities, do you have any unique ideas that may work? So how old, do we have any idea how old this child is maybe? That would be helpful. Um, I mean, just in general, how you want to organize a sensory diet. Is fourth, be fourth, grade. Hmm? fourth grade. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Okay. Fourth grade. Okay. So you want to make sure that the routines of the day are really set up as the schedule. And then um, lots of times we can add proprioceptive laden activity to transitions because they're kind of natural opportunities to get some heavy work. Proprioceptors are the muscle and joint receptors. And when you activate them, they kind of ground you in your body and they give you um, so that grounding in the body helps you to be in the here and now. It helps you to be present. And that is a really important thing for kids with Fragile X because their anxiety and their hyperarousal make them worried about the future. They make them worried about what's happening next, what's going on, what's going on, what's going to go on. So proprioception is really a cool um, and powerful sensory-based support because it kind of grounds you in the here and now. And that present state of being right here right now is really calming to the nervous system. Also activation of the muscles and the joint receptors is inhibiting to the nervous system. So proprioception kind of provides this base of calming and inhibition and that combination is what gives you um, a lot of power particular to Fragile X because we know we need to get more of those qualities for these kids. So the ways to do that are going to be um, really dependent on, on the child. But what you want to do is kind of get those muscles to fire. So sometimes we use this word heavy work to think about that's like an easy way to, to get proprioception. So if I um, am in a sit next to Mouse and I'm going to give her a squeeze or I'm going to give her a push or I'm mm -hmm. going to pick up her chair and I'm going to push it and I'm going to move it. So heavy work is squeezing, lifting, pushing. 
kinds of activities. So if I'm at school, you know, you can do things like um, stack chairs or, or push a cart or carry a bag, um, be like a messenger, be the errand person. So those kinds of things and kind of pairing them naturally into the transition so that it doesn't feel like an extra random thing you're doing. Um, we like to like have uh, a transition basket, for instance, mm -hmm. and it, maybe it's weighted. Um, the weight needs to be kind of calculated by the OT so that we know that we're loading that child according to their strength and their muscle tone and their age. So we don't want to make them into bodybuilders or like overtax their system. So that's really a clinical, a clinically guided question about the amount of weight. But you could have like a transition box, weight it, and then we like to put in it the thing that is relevant to what we're doing to help them mm -hmm. prepare for what's going on. So like if they're going to music class, maybe you put the recorders that everybody's going to go play and they get to be kind of a helper and in invoking that kind of um, positive, engaged idea in their mind so that it isn't um, feeling ever like it's restrictive or a limit or a, or a negative quality. So we want the sensory diet and the proprioceptive activities to fall in this kind of realm that we call positive behavioral support. It should be really a positive adjunct so that the, the child is really getting the input, but embedded in their routines of their day and uh, in the scope of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then for it to qualify as a true sensory diet, it isn't a one-off thing that you do. It's the kind of thing where, again, the therapist should help analyze what's the frequency and the timing of the activity schedule that's going to really support that child. So some of our kids with Fragile X have really unpredictable spikes in their arousal through the day. Others have more predictable spikes. <coughs> we want to make sure the OT is helping analyze that and then come up with a structure so that we can kind of track with um, data with looking at What's the frequency of their arousability? We want to stay in front of the rise of that so that we can kind of keep the nervous system in the most organized state. And that's going to happen with frequency, timing, and intensity of activity. Um, so if, if a child's doing a proprioceptive activity, let's say they're pushing a cart, we don't want them to just push it like from here four feet across the room. They might need to push it around all the hallways or something with longer durations. So the quality in terms of how long, how heavy, those kinds of things are kind of clinical questions that each OT should be helping you to answer for your child. Um, but in general, pushing, pulling, lifting, carrying things are the activity kind of choices that are going to be the most active proprioception. You can do passive proprioception with um, wearing something heavy or putting like a weighted lap pad on your lap. Um, and sometimes like if you have a child having to like listen to story time, for instance, maybe you're going to use that kind of more passive proprioception during those kinds of activities so that they're getting a little extra help to stay in that more calm, more inhibited state. Um, you can also have them activate their proprioceptors in their body by sitting sometimes like on a, a little move and sit cushion or sometimes we like these things called hokey stools so that a child can sit in the classroom, but they can get just a little bit of movement. And again, you're activating those muscles and receptors in the joints, and that fires off proprioceptors, and then that buys us some of that calming influence over the nervous system. 
So hopefully that kind of helps answer the question. Now, the other day we were talking to a family in another state and the, the team um, at school said, well, we don't really know what that period is. And you said that with kids with Fragile X, it's maybe you want to start out more typically giving um, uh, proprioceptive feedback every 12 to 15 minutes. Yeah, so, so I think with, you know, in just our years of knowing kids with Fragile X, we feel like that's a, uh, a baseline that's fairly typical is about every 15 minutes. If without intervention, without anything else going on, that their nervous systems really bounce out of a regulated state um, with a lot of frequency. And so <clears throat> the idea of kind of tracking this with careful observation, careful analysis of those are data points, right? When we watch a child and learn about them and observe what's going on, that's collecting data. And when we collect that information, it helps us to figure out the time schedule. Um, if a child is successfully able to maintain a regulated state for 15 minutes, then we want the sensory diet to hit <clears throat> just under that, like a 14 or 15 minute schedule, because we want to kind of err in the direction of what they're capable of instead of trying to say that we're going to just go every two hours and hope that their nervous system catches up. So one of the important things we want to do is get that information. How long does their nervous system stay in kind of an organized state? There could be lots of factors that are going into supporting that. Regardless, we want to kind of get a sense of what's the frequency that they kind of bounce out of that. And then we want to target our sensory diet to be just shy of that mark. And that helps us to start to grow the arousal function in a direction of maintaining a more organized state. Um, if we let them get disorganized and then try to catch up, it's always harder than if we stay in front of it and keep them in a state that's the most adaptive. So we want to, and so in general, we find that a starting point is often somewhere around 15 minutes, um, and then it can grow uh, as the intervention is in place. Um, one thing to, uh, to add to this is that um, we often think of just sort of the academic times of school for having the sensory diet in place, but we need it to be in place as um, uh, and following these principles um, in a way that's, that's proactive. So we don't want to just forget about the sensory diet when it's time to go into the lunchroom for half an hour and then Perhaps there's recess afterwards. Um, recess is often, and PE, well, not PE, but recess is often a time where there's nothing structured hap happening, which can be a real trigger for some difficulties for kids with Fragile X because of a lot of those motor planning difficulties. Um, so let's remember to think about, as a team, well, how are we going to provide sensory diet input before and uh, perhaps during recess time as well. So you know, I I like all those ideas, and, and so tell me. And, and so in general, would you say that you're kind of you know once you you look at about this 15 minute time frame, are you kind of going from gross motor or like a sensory activity to more fine motor to a sensory activity? I mean, are are we just doing that? all throughout the day at a time zone that, or a time frame that works for the child, kind of? Is that too general? Let's, uh, <clears throat> so, I, so I think what we do when we design a sensory diet is we look at the routines of the day. Um, so the routines are going to be marked by transitions, and then, um, and then the routines are going to be also marked by what is the sort of academic requirement or what is it that we're trying to get the child engaged in. And so if I'm doing um, a sensory diet that's proprioceptively organized, which is often true for a child with fragile X, let's say that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really track their transition. So I'm going to start 
before they even come to school. We're going to hopefully have this integrated at home um, so that how the child is kind of organized in the morning to get ready for their day has the sensory qualities that are going to help them to get into the most regulated state possible. And then they have this big transition, right? They have to leave home and somehow get to school. So sometimes that's a big deal for some of our kids, depending on what, what all that transition entails. Then they arrive at school and they have to enter into a whole different way of being. So they're ready for learning. And the, the point of the sensory diet at school is really to help the child to be able to access the curriculum, be engaged in the learning environment, be engaged in the social relationships that support their learning with adults and peers, um, and to manage all of the unpredictability that is a part of every single school day. And so you're going to track what that day kind of looks like. Um, and then in each chunk of the day, Let's say that they kind of come in and they're going to have um, kind of put your materials away and get ready for reading class. So a fourth grade student, they're going to have reading or something right off. So the activity might be kind of gross motor in a way, Jane, like you were saying, where they're, maybe they come in and their job is to erase all the boards and get them ready for the learning environment. And we can make that a little bit more heavy work by um, either how we structure that erasing activity or the material that they're using or how they access it. So really embedding it into the day and making these individuals kind of a part of the learning environment and not just having everything happen aside, we find really supports the child. But now, okay, now the whiteboards are erased. I'm ready for learning. Maybe now it's, learn, it's reading class, so now there's a basket where they get to pass out the books to all the kids. So there's a little heavy work. Now they get to sit down at the table, and maybe they have um, a visual schedule where they're going to mark, I'm going to read three pages, and then I get to take a break, or I'm going to read three pages, and then I'm going to color a picture, and then I'm going to read three more pages. So we might do a sub-schedule. And again, that, that kind of um, doing that sub-schedule, we might embed uh, some kind of proprioceptive activity in that, like put my weighted pad on my lap, read three pages, take it off, color my book, put it back on. So we might embed it into the day like that. And so I think your idea of gross motor to fine motor is kind of what we like to see happen in that the transition is supported off in more gross motor and the focal activity, whatever that engaged learning opportunity is, might be a little more fine motor in nature. Does that kind of match what yes. you're saying? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, and I had heard that from parents and so I wanted to, I mean, sometimes and so what I, what you said is that, you know, sometimes I think people generalize a sensory diet as gross motor, fine motor, gross motor, fine motor, but it's more complicated than that. It is a little bit more complicated than that, yeah. And I think, too, you know, in a school, it's unlikely that you're going to have an OT with the child all day because it's just the way that funding works and all of those things. So um, what you want to do is have the schedule set, but then with each activity, it's really helpful to say, what's the intention of this? Why are we doing this? Because sometimes people start to treat these sensory activities as kind of like um, an adjunct, or they don't understand how it's related to the rest of the goals of the IEP, or they don't understand um, kind of the intent of it. And so it's important to assign intent. Um, it's also important because if I'm giving mouse proprioception and my intent is, you're bugging me, kid, and just get your work done here, <laughs> you're going to pick that up from me. Because mm -hmm. our kids with Fragile X, you know, the arousal issues make them more emotional. They're really like emotional sponges. And they're emotional sponges in the way we support them. So the sensory diet, the intent of the activity, it needs to be 
come on, I'm on your team, I'm with you here. We're going to do this and you are awesome and we're going to accomplish this thing and let's get your body really mm -hmm. calm and ready to do this thing. And so I think the sensory diet, because it should be structured across the day, in so many ways it's, it's like the structure that holds our intention for learning. And for a kid with fragile X, it's really important because they get so organized. Um, and so we need to have something that's in place continually to proactively keep them in the best state for learning. And that's really what the intention overall of the sensory diet is. And so each activity in it also has to have that intention. I got you. And I think that, you know, my son is now 28 and um, I still see the importance of that even at his age. He works at a grocery store and what they discovered is that if they send him out to do gather carts, that when he comes in to bag groceries, he's much more productive. He, he's more on task, more centered. And so it's been, and so he does, he pull, pushes and pulls the, the carts, comes in and bags for a while pushes and pulls, you know, goes out and collects cards and does the same thing and it, it has turned out to be a very productive day for him by that's continuing see, that's to do that. beautiful mm -hmm. and, and what you've done is you've, um, you've used the context within which he's working. So for, for him, pushing and pulling the cards because he works at a grocery store makes sense. So when you're in school, just saying the words, oh, it's time for a sensory break and going to a sensory room is not really sort of an integrated way to um, make the sensory diet really powerful. Um, so that's why it's so important to have it, um, to really understand uh, what the philosophy is behind it and um, what really works specifically for that child and how you're going to use context in the day to make it meaningful for them. Thanks. Well, we should probably move on. Though someone did say, so do you have any more information about a hokey stool? Oh, sure. So there, <laughs> there are a few different, you know, even IKEA kind of yeah. sells one of these now, but it's it's not as um, dynamic. Um, so this is like a chair that um, has a single leg, but then the base of it is really wide, and it's just, it's stable, but it moves a little bit. You buy it, they, they make them in a variety of sizes, mm -hmm. so that when you sit on it, or if you buy one for a child, you want it to measure so that they're, you know, sitting with 90 degrees of flexion at their hip and their knee. Because that kind of sets your body up, your posture up for attention. But then you sit on this little stool and it kind of can wiggle underneath you. It doesn't move so much that it's distracting, which is why we really like that particular stool. You spell it H-O-K-K-I, and it's just a nice little um, easy thing to put into a classroom and have a child sit on it instead of a regular chair. Um, our kids with Fragile X, because they have this lower muscle tone, that loose connective tissue that's associated with the syndrome, you know, it's harder for these kids to just sit in a chair and maintain their attention. Because as soon as you sit down, I have low muscle tone, so this happens to me too. When you sit <laughs> in a chair, you just start to kind of melt. melt. <laughs> Spaghetti. And then when your body melts, your attention melts with it. So the idea of these kind of um, supports that activate your core posture they keep your body upright and engaged, and that helps your attention to be upright and engaged. So that's so. Someone asked about a ten-year-old who keeps getting up from a chair. Any recommendations on a type of chair? So that would be a good recommendation than a hokey chair. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really like them a lot. Yep. And of course, you know, sometimes these kids they they're really good at at kind of moving towards the stuff they like and moving away from the stuff they don't like. And sometimes harnessing that effortful control, that kind of, I'm going to stick in here and do this hard thing, is something we have to work on with them a lot. So the, but, but when your body sets you up to, I can't sit for very long because I'm inattentive, 
then there's an extra reason for them to leave besides the fact that they're a little impulsive sometimes and they're a little drawn to whatever's yeah that's it yeah yeah, yeah. can you Great. see it I just I just googled hokey stool and this was when they came up on Amazon yeah and so it's, yeah mm -hmm. so it's kind of wobbly just a little bit but it just a little not so much but just a little and it's a lot easier to manage in a classroom we used to recommend things like sitting on a therapy ball or something, but those roll around and it's hard, and they look like a ball, so it's hard for, for these kids sometimes to not treat it like a ball. This it looks like a chair, and yeah. so that fairness about it kind of helps to suggest to them this is for sitting on, um, and that also, you know, is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> it looks kind. Of, it looks like fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I might. <laughs> um, I think it would be good for me to work on because I tend to melt too after a while when I look on my computer. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're going to kind of jump to uh, a different topics. Any ideas for a teenage girl to help with organization, scheduling, keeping up with schoolwork? The executive functioning is difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, that's yeah. That's what we see. Um, yeah. uh, off, you know, we were we've been talking a lot about this about executive functions, and in the, you know not just kids with fragile X, but you know kids in regular schools that have this as a huge issue, and a lot of people are bringing in executive function coaches. Isn't that right? They're um, yeah, they're sometimes. like tutors, but they're yeah. not really. Tutors, they're, they have more strength within executive function and working with individuals. Yeah, and I think, too, also um, the American Occupational Therapy Association has an initiative to, to try to help mm -hmm. OTs really um, support, you know, kids and adults around these executive functions because it falls within our scope of practice as well. Um, part of the reason that a coach or a therapist can be helpful is especially with the teenager, mm -hmm. is that kids at that age naturally are starting to kind of um, find independence. And what happens is that they get less open to their parents giving them a lot of guidance. Yeah. And it can be a real source of power struggle. And it's also an age where schools are expecting kids to start to be a lot more independent. So in the younger grades, teachers do a lot of scaffolding and setting up supports around, you know, take your paper, put it in the middle of your book, close your book, okay, now yeah. put your book under your desk. In middle school and high school, you don't have teachers doing that kind of scaffolding anymore. And so you start to see these inherent organizational problems that are associated with problems with executive functioning kind of really show themselves because now you have to be more independent in managing your materials and things like that. Um, so a couple things. You know, executive functions are an outgrowth of basic regulatory functions. And regulatory functions always start in relationship. They start in a sense of connectedness and belonging. So, so that may sound like kind of like a... a <laughs> you know, a theoretical connection, but, but, but in our interventions, it's really important that the child, this now this emerging young adult, this middle school child, um, have a real sense of competence being empowered into them and not always feeling like a failure. Because what we see happen with these kids is that they're kind of inherently a little disorganized. Things get lost, mm -hmm. I forget to do things. My working memory is a little short-circuited, and it's hard to hold on. And now I start to feel a little bit less than. And then that's a setup for not having the motivational drive mm -hmm. that pushes you to just take those two extra steps to put your thing away the right way. And it starts to become a vicious cycle. So we really often find that it is kind of a therapeutic um, need and so either you know a, a coach a psychologist an OT somebody 
to help the child kind of find themselves in the organization. So there's lots of books written on executive function structures and strategies, but if we just impose that on a child, it's unlikely that they're going to take that and grab it and love it. What we kind of need is somebody to work with them to figure out what is it that kind of makes them feel a connection to the strategy, a connection to the support, and where it comes more from them, and then it is more likely that they'll follow through on it than if we impose a strategy that is hard for them to feel like it's theirs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really probably the kind of thing where I would recommend that you contact an OT, a psychologist, or an executive function coach and see who, you know, and it's not a long-term kind of therapeutic thing that needs to happen. It's, it's a short-term thing. But it, it needs to have a little bit of guidance outside of the family because kids at this age are a little resistant mm -hmm. to mom and dad saying, try it this way. Um, so that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All of our answers are long. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a good. I mean, I never. But I mean, a couple things that to stand out are that is to bring someone else in because, you know, by the time they hit middle school or as they age, you know, they want someone other than they're they're tired of their mom telling them, you know, or giving suggestions or telling them what to do. So it's better when it comes from somebody else. Yeah, um, and yeah. you know, it's funny. I work with this little girl right now, um, and her teacher, her special education teacher, who she loves. Um, decided to take on this role of being her kind of executive function coach. And so she started working with her. And now that little girl has gone from loving her special education teacher to feeling like her teacher has become kind of like mm. um, the person who's kind of judging her and not feeling like she's living up to the standard and nagging her all the time. And it's really interfered with their relationship. So this whole thing around executive function, think about like any of us, like how do you organize your makeup bag? How do you organize your purse? How do you organize your desk? It's very personal. Nobody else would do it the way you do it because you're you. And so in a way, the way we organize ourselves is an expression of ourselves. And when somebody starts to tell you that what you're doing isn't on par, there's nothing that is more penetrating, especially to a middle school girl. So we, I think it's really um, a sensitive issue. And, and you know, we're annoyed. It's easy to be annoyed. I remember when my daughter was a middle schooler and I'd be like, I'm going to go out of my mind because her room was messy or whatever. But, you know, there's, there's um, a sensitivity that we have to bring to this because our girls with Fragile X are pretty tender and they're also really tough and we kind of have to help them to find themselves in this and not make them feel like it's yet another thing that's hard for me. That makes, hopefully that makes sense. It does. It does. Okay. Any advice on overstuffing and messy eating? Oh, yeah. Well, how, how old of a, an individual? Um, probably a young one, I imagine. Um, it doesn't. I don't know. Yes. But, you know, I mean, you see, I think you just said that is, um, I think eating can be an issue for a lot of kids. So. Right, right. And, and believe us, we see a lot of um, kids as they start growing up in um, elementary school and middle school who are, continue to be uh, messy eaters because they haven't really had the advantage of some therapy early on. Um, and, you know, being a messy eater could really result from a number of issues. It could be, um, there's really a lot. It could be because of um, a resistance to some of the textures of the food. It could be um, uh, difficulties with, um, you know, enlarged adenoids and tonsils, so their their tongue is in the more uh, in the front of their mouth because 
their tonsils and adenoids are so large. Um, it could be that they don't have really strong musculature to move the food around in um, an appropriate way for eating. And um, so what's really important is to do a really thorough evaluation of um, what are the issues and, um, and try and really get to the bottom of is it a sensory issue, is it um, a motor planning issue, um, is it a problem with the structure, the actual structure of the oral area? Um, is it a is it a problem with um, you know the defensiveness? Um, and then you can sort of decide uh, where do I go from here? Uh, how do I help them with the with the overstuffing? And do I take a little bit of a uh, more of a behavioral approach, or do I try and help them not stuff their mouth by um, try and incorporating those, that wonderful use of visuals so that they know how to take um, a smaller number of bites rather than grabbing an entire uh, handful of goldfish and put, putting them in their mouths. We can make a beautiful visual structure um, and teach them um, with um, a lot of rhythm and kind of a sing-song type of thing. Take one goldfish put it in your mouth, and just really get into that calming rhythm um, to help try and shift those behaviors. You know, it's a really important question, and I, I know that there was a conversation um, in the Fragile X group this week because there were a couple parents talking about um, one mom who has a brother with Fragile X, or I think it was an uncle with Fragile X oh. who ended up um, choking and being found. Um, and didn't survive it, and a couple other people talked about how that was also in their family history. Um, you know, sometimes we think about this overstuffing as just a messiness, but it, it is a risk factor because if you overstuff your mouth, you, you can more likely choke. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like Mouse was saying, this kind of positive behavioral support, helping them understand what is a portion, what is a bite, and doing that in a positive way that helps them to start to understand that on a very big picture and not um, the kind of thing where you're constantly having to police them. So we find those um, visual structures, we mm -hmm. make plates and Divided plates, things, yeah. and um, you can buy these cute plates now that show a bite at a time kind of thing. They, they were really developed to encourage children to eat novel foods, mm -hmm. but those are also really fun to show what does a bite, what is a portion, what is that about? And our kids with Fragile X are a little impulsive, and they kind of mm -hmm. also, like Mouse was saying, for all those different issues she listed, they they their mouth kind of works better when there's a lot more stuff in it. So we might need to start a meal by improving skillfulness. Skillfulness of awareness, skillfulness of motor, so that that becomes a part of the routine of eating. That first you, um, you know, take a goldfish and move it from the right cheek to the left cheek and from the left cheek to the right cheek. And you might have to play some games like that to help build the awareness mm -hmm. and then let that set the scene for mm -hmm. the rest of the meal so that you're not having to have the whole meal every meal all the time but we start to have the first part of the meal be skill building and awareness building and then let the visuals guide and really start to develop habits that over lots of practice develop the skill that you want um, mm -hmm. So it's just like anything else. It's going to take some learning, some really engaged opportunities to learn that this is a fun and the, the thing to do and that it's not a drag or a hassle. Um, so your attitude really matters um, around how you mm -hmm. support a child in these kinds of things. And also, it's really fun to do some video modeling around that too either with other family members or, you know, someone from the school that the, the uh, child really, really likes, eating, uh, you know, humming or singing a little song about taking a bite and also, um, uh, you know, taking the appropriate uh, size of a bite and chewing it, taking a drink, 
Um, and that's a great way to model that behavior for individuals. And um, just, you know, you want to remember that at dinner time, um, you want to, as Tracy said, just keep that beginning part with the, the fun practice of eating because sometimes kids are so ravenous and, and um, so we don't want to um, beleaguer them with having every meal be a practice session. So, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, one thing I think I've discovered is that, you know, those things, I mean, even something like that you're talking about, you know, modeling and, and, um, and teaching it is how many skills like that that we actually have to teach our children. You yeah. Know, you, have to, you have to kind of teach or maybe teach or talk about everything. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's often true with these ADLs, you know, things, activities of daily living, eating, um, toothbrush, how you, yeah. how you manage the messiness. How you manage the messiness of toileting or dressing, things mm -hmm. that we um, sort of think there's lots of little parts to it that are just kind of assumed and inherent, but for our kids, you have to teach them all the pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, someone did ask, so how are pushing and pulling different? So this was going back kind of the, to the sensory diet. Is, isn't one alerting and the other one calming? It was the question. So um, if I, so pushing, um, you know, is, is the act of pushing mm -hmm. out into space and pulling is this act of coming in. So if you come into your midline, that's a lot more calming than if you push out where mm -hmm. you kind of have to be aware of what's out there. So on some level, there is a variance in the quality um, for sure, but it isn't true for everyone. Child, and it also isn't true for every activity. So if I'm pushing a stack of heavy chairs, I'm not pushing it out into space. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing it maybe into position. So that's going to be not something to worry so much about in terms of that quality. And it's at midline. And it's at midline. And, yeah. So things that are at midline or pull you into your midline or activate the middle um, musculature are always a lot more calming than things that are distal um, or out in space or away from your midline. So um, those are some interesting rules of thumb. I think those are things that, again, your therapist should be kind of guiding you on. So we want to really carefully, that's why, you know, we don't, we are not fans of giving people a list of activities and saying, you know, go forth and do these activities. We'd rather have um, each child have an individualized plan that fits them um, instead of trying to just use a general list because there's always some nuance mm -hmm. that can be particular to a child. Um, I really like that. Each child having their own, you know, working with an OT, or and actually in conjunction with a speech therapist to come up with a, what works for that child. Um, okay, um, let's move to how to stop a ten-year-old boy with fragile X. Um, he's to get to try to get peers' attention by his behavior. He makes noises, put his feet up on a chair, or makes distractions to try and get other kids' attention. Oh, well, well it's so effective. It works. I mean, that's how mouse always can fly. <laughs> Tracy, Tracy. Sometimes I don't even use words. Sometimes she just throws things at me. Ah! <laughs> get my, I, we always get each other's attention. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So a couple things. One thing we want to do is we want to do some peer training. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that the peers have information to know if he throws something at you, don't react to it. Um, but maybe come back around and say, are you ready to play a game? And help them to model an appropriate social bid. So we need to do a lot of peer training. Mm -hmm. And the peers need to know what are those really particular little slivers <laughs> of social skill that we want the child to actually do. 
So what you want them to do is you want them to notice each other. You want them to, to ask or make a request. You want mm -hmm. them to offer an opportunity to have fun together, to crack up, to do something. And you want them to do it during times that are social times and not instructional times. So there's these different, and, and in, the, in the autism literature, those things are identified as pivotal social behaviors. And there's a whole literature on how you train peers in being responsive to those really critical social behaviors that we want to promote and help them invoke. So if their zany behavior gets a big response, they're going to do the zany behavior because mm -hmm. there's nothing nothing better. better. Yeah. yeah. It's like cool and fun and hilarious. And kids with fragile X are super motivated by that goofy juice. And they love it, right? So you have to really be proactive in helping the peers know how to be responsive. Um, you and, need to help them, the child, develop mm -hmm. other skills. Um, how do I ask? How do I get their attention? How do I play? Mm -hmm. And lots of times they don't know how to play. Exactly. They just know how to get the rise. They know how to get the reaction, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to sustain an interaction or let it build into something that's nicer and longer and has more quality to it. So those are are things that we have to work on in mm -hmm. both the peer group and the child and so, so it's a lot about identifying where the skill deficit is yeah yeah you can do some you know the speech therapist should be doing some um, also maybe some push in where a typical peer comes into the classroom that the, the child is um, in and familiar with and work on um, a, a typical interaction of how do, how do you get their attention um, let's let's set up a situation where they want to play a game together, or maybe let's set up a situation where they want to look at some videos together um, about uh, the local football team and and make comments about them together. I mean, let's find out what are the interests that these kids share and what can they talk about, um, and then we step back and we go right from the beginning. You know, what are the skills we need? Um, we can use video modeling to really um, hone in on how do you make a social bid? Do you throw the Valentine's candy <laughs> at them? Or do you say, uh, do you go, hey, Tracy, hey, Tracy, look at my football cards. Look at my football cards. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Look at them. Look at them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, um, yeah, we want to we wanna get in there and we want to shift this really quickly because it's just a huge setup for um, uh, for the behavior to continue and for the lack of a true sort of wonderful relationship to develop. So let's get in there and, and turn this around. Thank you. Those are great ideas. I mean, teaching the other kids is, again, you know, teaching, teaching everyone. Um, okay, here's a sleep question for you. We're having real problems with getting our child to get enough sleep at night. We have a solid bedtime routine without screen time in the evening. We use melatonin. And, and let me know if this is, uh, uh, if, if we need to, I can pass this on like to maybe uh, Dr. Hagerman or, um, off, anyway, often he wakes up at 3 or 3.30 a.m. It's a struggle to get him back to sleep. Even when he does, he always wakes up at 5 o'clock. He's four years old, turning, oops, I just lost it, turning five soon. Any recommendations? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, he's young. Kids at this age often are going to have some, a little bit of waking in the night because as they, as they fall asleep and then they go into that natural, a little bit of a wake in, the, in that three to four time period, sometimes it's, well, it, the, the time frame will be different, but there's a period where your arousal is a little lighter in your sleep and so sometimes kids wake up and then they they think they're awake and so part of it is you have a good bedtime routine but let's back up to that um, what what does that actually look like so sometimes what happens is people have a really good bedtime routine but it includes mom and dad have to be there there's lullabies there's books there's all these things 
And so the, the going to sleep is associated with all this stuff. Now you wake up at 3 in the morning, and to get back to sleep, you might have to recreate all of that stuff. So part of what we need to do is sort of back up and say, how can we start to have the child start to have more of that I fall asleep be the thing that they're doing, that it's in them, not in the routine and in the people around them. So I don't know if that's true, but that's an often a part of the problem. So we, we have these beautiful, yummy times at bedtime that are full of parent-guided going to sleep that's not available at 3 in the morning unless they wake you up to come back and be with them. Um, so so the, the routine, just analyze it and see what you can do to start to have them have going to sleep on their own be a part of the routine. Because we all wake up in the middle of the night and we all have to be able to go back to sleep in the middle of the night. There are, you know, there, there are some medical um, concerns around just the organization of the circadian rhythms in Fragile X that are more of a question that I think Rondi would answer. And the formulation of the melatonin, um, whether it's extended release or not, can also be something to look at because that longer lasting melatonin can sometimes be pretty helpful um, for those middle of the night wakings. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, those are big picture issues. But it's a really important question because the more disrupted sleep, the more disrupted day is going to be. So it has an impact on learning. It has an impact on development. Mm -hmm. It has an impact on behavior. Um, so we need to back up and manage sleep because otherwise all those other things are going to be impacted uh, in a negative way by the sleep difficulty. You know, we have a consensus document on sleep. I'll have to go back through and look to see if it has information on when a child wakes at night. But, I mean, I think that, you know, it's uh, learning to fall asleep on your own is um, is hard for all of us. You know, it's you're like somebody there to talk to. <laughs> exactly right. And, you know, like even for myself, like I, you know, I travel a lot. So when I get to wherever I happen to be, I'm in a new hotel, new city, new whatever, my husband's not there, that first night is always harder for me than a subsequent night. Because she always <laughs> knocks on my door and says, Mouse, could you please get me a glass of warm milk? And I'm, I'm frankly getting tired of it. <laughs> That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. so you it's hard. It's hard. really hard. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when we travel on... Um, you know, overseas and you get really disrupted, we take the extended release melatonin and that, that really helps um, with the sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can talk to your doctor about that. Yeah. Um, okay, here is another question because I see it's already five to, um, before the hour. My nine-year-old daughter, full mutation, fragile X, bites her finger when she's excited, frustrated, or angry. Uh, besides biting her finger for these extreme emotions, she does not do any other oral chewing or biting. Is there something I can do to stop this? Uh, or should I discourage it? She has a large red callus on that finger. But I, but I know I hear from lots of families, you know, kids bite their hand, you know, they, they've got calluses. So, yeah, different parts. Yeah, different parts. So talk a little bit about biting. Yeah, so, you know, when you get that big surge of arousal, and affect, um, what happens is your, your brain tells you, uh-oh, this is too much. And so it, you, what, it, what it's doing is it's saying to you, you need to, you need to settle down a little bit. We need, brain needs to settle down a little bit. And so the go-to strategies are going to often include biting because you have this wiring, especially in these front teeth that is really powerful in sending a signal of slow down. Um, and it's, it's a really complicated neurological kind of circuit that, that is involved. But it, so to interrupt it, there's a couple things. It's not really like oral seeking. It's more like 
I, my brain is kind of on fire right now, and I need my brain to calm down. So what we need to do is work on building for her. You know, I, I think kids need five at least. Go to well-rehearsed, well-practiced regulatory strategies that you can cue her. And they have to work better than biting work. Because if biting is more effective at calming her brain down than the strategy that we would offer her, she'll do the biting because it's better. Um, so that's, again, where I would work therapeutically with her, have the OT work with her to help her develop self-regulation strategies that are really specific for her. What really helps her to feel, you know, her most... <laughs> calm down when she gets a big surge and spike in arousal. So sometimes what we're doing in therapy is we're in bringing arousal up so that we can practice bringing it down. And we do that in safe, playful ways in the intervention um, so that her brain can feel that feeling of, whoa, that was really hilarious and fun. Oops, what are my options? And we start to build these regulatory strategies so that when she starts to go to bite, you can say to her, oh, remember, or try that, or whatever. And we like to pair it with um, maybe she has her thumb strategy and her index strategy. You know, you, she can go through her fingers and pair strategies to them so that she has other options that are well-practiced and ready to roll. Um, Biting is just really effective because it is effective orally. It's effective in terms of this kind of little endorphin that it releases. And your hand is always there. And so the, the constant availability of it and the power of the actual input are what make it so hard to combat. But if she has other powerful strategies, then it's easier to direct her to them. Okay. Um, I don't know if we're, this, I'm reading something now, I don't know if we're just in a phase, but my full mutation fragile X six-year-old is very often wetting himself and he's successfully, passively, sensory grounded. Your thoughts? Okay, so so read it again because I think I missed one of the details. Yeah. So he wets himself when he's grounded. When he's successfully, passively, sensory grounded. So and so I and I don't know if they're still want to provide more information, but so he's wetting himself. It sounds like when he has um, successfully grounded himself, um, right. you know. Sensor, sensory, sensorily. It's really needed. Um, let me see if I can explain this in short order. So most of our kids with fragile X get a little hyper aroused. So hyper arousal. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a a range here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this would be the middle of the range, and most of them kind of spike up here. This hyperarousal typically in fragile X, in the research anyway, and, and in our clinical experience as well, um, is associated with an activation of the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so that we call that sympathetic hyperarousal. And you get this activation. The opposite of that, so now you ground this kid and they're coming way down here. And this ground of arousability, particularly in fragile X, is overly associated with something that's called the parasympathetic state. So the opposite of sympathetic activation is parasympathetic. You have two branches of the autonomic nervous system. And the parasympathetic system and the sympathetic system kind of work off of these poles, if you will. Sympathetic activation, we all have heard the phrase fear, or fight, or flight. The phrase that's associated with parasympathetic is rest and recovery. 
So when you get into too deep of a sympathetic, mm -hmm. parasympathetic state, you can faint, you can gag and vomit sometimes, and you can lose bowel control. So probably, and I don't know this child, but just in other kids with fragile X, what can happen is as they're moving in these states, these are physiological, neurological states, okay, which is why we want to have an occupational therapist treating this and not going to some random uneducated medical, you know, non-medical intervention like the Brain Balance Center or places like that that just have no medical training because these kids are moving in physiologically neurologically based state and if you and so this is like exercise right I'm I'm growing this state I'm growing this state I'm growing this state I'm growing this state if you put him into too low of a state that his nervous system doesn't know how to handle he's going to show you maladaptation he's going to show you that's not working for me and so that state now becomes disorganizing and it's making him wet his pants. Up here, we see a dysregulation and a maladaptation when kids have fear. I'm terrified. Fight. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to throw something at you. I'm going to tell you you are the worst person on the planet. Fear, fight, or flight kinds of behaviors. I'm going to run away from you. But down here, we're going to see an overactivation of that parasympathetic state. And so, you know, kids can have a real disruption down there. And that, so that's likely what's going on. So what we need to do is kind of work a little higher and help him get really regulated there before we go that low. Okay, I think the, the person added a little more information. That sounds exactly like what's going on. It happens in yoga classes all the time. So if you, if you go to a yoga instructor or if you go to a yoga re retreat, You'll hear people talk about when people get into a really deep meditative state that they can lose some of their control. They might wet their pants. They, they might have extra gas exchanges. <laughs> um, it can be a very gassy experience to go to a yoga class because when people get down into this parasympathetic aesthetic state, you can get um, a little bit too much activation there. So it's not an unknown ex phenomenon, in other words. That's so interesting. I've never heard that. Um, <laughs> okay, we're, we're past the hour, but I have one thing we, topic we haven't touched on, and then um, I guess we're just going to have to have you guys back on a regular basis. We're happy to do that. We love you guys. Um, okay, this is a very general question, so you, it, I don't know whether you'll have enough information. I have an 18-year-old fragile X male with aggressive behavior, looking for suggestions, looking for suggestions more so than have a question. So it's an 18-year-old with aggressive behaviors. That's all the information I have. Let me see if she's going to add anything else. Well, you really need to try and understand what is behind the aggressive behaviors. You know, mm -hmm. we know we know so much about fragile X that we can think to ourselves: um, is the aggressive behavior because of um, moving into fear, fight, or flight because of hyperarousal? Is it because anxiety is playing a role? Is it because the, he's in high school and they're not teaching to the fragile X? learning style and he's becoming um, aggressive because he's extremely frustrated. So, I mean, those are some of the things we, we know to look for right away. Mm -hmm. How about if I throw anxiety in this? So she just typed in anxiety, usually triggered by anxiety. So there you go. All right. So what are we doing to manage the anxiety? You, you just have to back up and, uh -huh. you know, we always suggest that you're going to do these, this kind of concert of positive, proactive interventions to manage anxiety. So there's sensory-based strategies, routine-based strategies, and some language-based strategies. And you have to kind of look at what's being done to manage anxiety holistically, 
There could also be another layer of medication that's added in mm -hmm. there. Um, so that really needs to be looked at carefully. And then, you know, the anxiety isn't just happening out of the blue. It's happening because, or, and the aggression. So you mm -hmm. want to back up, back up, back up, and then get your interventions yeah. really well organized. Because it's a real setup, you know, and at 18, mm -hmm. you know, the world is big. Um, lots and of so are the children are big. And, yeah, and he's mm -hmm. strong. And mm -hmm. so there's lots of um, issues there, and that's really going to require a big team wraparound to get a handle on that. One thing to absolutely be sure of is, um, is the anxiety caused because of lack of consistency in the schedule, um, and, uh, and therefore, you know, what are you doing so that he's got a predictable day from when he goes to bed from, uh, I mean, from waking up in the morning till he goes to bed. And, you know, we, we often pull some information from the TEACH program in North Carolina where um, throughout the day to keep anxiety at bay, individuals need to know the answer to these four questions of, what am I supposed to be doing? How long will it last? How do I know what's coming up next? And what happens next? And, oh, yeah, how do I, yeah. When, wait, wait, I got it all wrong. What am I supposed to be doing? Okay, Adele, back okay. up, start the music over. Start the music! <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to be doing? How long, how long it? does it last? How do I know when it's, uh, when it's over and what comes next? Mm -hmm. So it's this cycle of, What's coming up next? And when I'm done with that, what's coming up next? And that has to be represented in, in a way that makes sense. So it's not going to be me telling Tracy, um, well, you've got to hand out your Valentines, and then after that, go do your math work. It, we're going to be having a visual schedule to, to help alleviate um, the anxiety associated with all of these transitions. And um, uh, keeping individuals informed about what's coming up in their day, and providing that consistent feedback for them is, you know, one of the basic ways we all know um, to, to help alleviate some of that anxiety. Well, I think it, I know that you guys have said before that, you know, you hear about people who use a visual schedule and then, and then the teacher will say, oh, well, they don't need it anymore. Exactly. And so, I mean, think about, think, I mean, that's because I, I mean, I, I have, I don't have a visual schedule per se, but I still have a schedule in my head of what's going to happen today, tomorrow, you know, over the next, you know, few months, if you want to say that. So we all still use that, no matter our age and that's ability. Right. And, and people fade out these strategies because they think that they're um, not needed anymore. You know, and then you end up being 18, and everybody's faded all your strategies, and now you don't have them anymore, and now right. you start getting aggressive. So that that's yeah. the usual thing we see is that for good, at, you know, people think they're doing right by the child. They're fading things out because they think, oh, they don't need them anymore, or they're more independent now. They don't really, you know, but like you said, we all need these structures and supports. Um, I use a calendar. I use... Right, you know, we all do those things. Otherwise, we would never know what we were supposed to be doing. And um, mm -hmm. then I would probably be aggressive and hitting. Oh, too. I would be too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, we don't fade those visual schedules out because of that learning strength. They need to rely on those uh, those visual cues to help them uh, to help them remain organized throughout their day. And so, when we're working with schools or families, we always say never, never think you're going to fade that away and um, because they'll always need them. And they'll go from uh, a system that is um, maybe a, a photo schedule or, or then move into something that might be on an iPad and if they're, if they're able to write, who knows, maybe the visual schedule will be a written list or a calendar on their iPhone. Um, the technology can always change, but the need for that never goes away. Well, that's, um, yeah, you know maybe, yeah. It's, it's change, it changes, but yes. Yeah, my schedule right now says, tell you tell you how much we love you, Jane. Thank yeah, you. real love. <laughs> um. Okay, only you. I think I said that, ah. only you. Uh, 
So thank you. Um, you know, one a lady answered, uh, asked a question, and I'll see if I can help her with it because her son's having oral surgery, and she wanted some ideas on to approach the plan for oral surgery. I don't know if you have any maybe words of wisdom for her before we sign up. It is 10 past the hour, um, but he's having his wisdom teeth pulled. So um, any? Yeah, have we seen something printed um, before? Because we know that. Um, you know, weeks before or a certain amount of time before you actually have the surgery, you're going to want to have some positive experiences um, at the center, driving up and parking there, uh, going in and meeting the secretary and meeting the doctor and um, um, having these um, well-organized um, situations that they engage in there so that they feel comfortable at that place mm -hmm. and to explore um, uh, what's going to happen eventually when they go have the oral surgery. So it's not frightening and, also, and new. You know, the the supportive kind of like make if they can if they don't like cold in their mouth, start working on making sure that they can mm -hmm. tolerate popsicles and their favorite flavors and maybe make them and Kind of do some things to make that that healing associated with something kind of special that I don't get all the time, and that it's available and afford and um, accepted. Mm -hmm. um, to you know, yeah. And then you know, I think you know, make sure that you have um, some extra helpers for you as mom around, like oh, your that's girl good. that day to be there to help you. That you're. Um, you know, that you have your favorite kind of popsicle wine pop in the freezer yeah. ready to go, whatever. The jello me. shooters. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Um, you know, I think, so I mean, I just to, and I can, I'm happy to talk with you more um, this mom, but um, yeah, I mean, my strategy is to schedule the surgery as early as you can so you get them up in the middle of the night when they're just so kind of like, and you, uh, you know, and you get them into, um, I mean, I know we had to go into the hospital. I mean, we didn't do it. I mean, I don't know uh, where you're going in, but we actually, there was no way we were going to ever, ever do this in a dentist's office. We had to go into the hospital, and uh, and they allowed me to go into the uh, the operating room where they were going to do that. And, you know, they put me on, they put a gown on me because it was hard to start a, an IV. And so there are strategies for that, but it's really kind of figuring out what's going to, you know, if uh, it is figuring out, you know, how, how to keep the anxiety down in your own child. You know, do you do a lot of preemptive stuff or do you wake them up, you know, when they're, if you keep them up really late and get them up really early so they're really tired when you go? Um, um, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Because there are yeah. some kids that if you give them too much information ahead of time, they're a total mess. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, you really have to go by what you're yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, you guys, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all your expertise with us. Um, you have a wealth of information about Fragilex. You truly are amazing. So um, um, happy Valentine's Day to you. I just, I want to tell everyone else, we are rolling in the webinars. I'm, David okay. is, um, is, uh, we're getting lots of webinars going. We actually have Vicki Sedhalter here uh, Thursday afternoon, this Thursday afternoon, oh. 5 o'clock Eastern time to talk about IEPs. So join us for that. Um, again, 5 o'clock Eastern time. And um, so that's the way it is, February 14th, 2017. Um, right. thank, you, thank you so much. Thanks. Have a, see you soon. Bye. Bye.